Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School lesson for Sunday, October 18th, 2020. We are in Lesson 7 uh, of Unit 2. Unit 2 is entitled Inclusive Love. Uh, and this is from the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly. Our lesson title is Meeting the Needs of Others. Meeting the Needs of Others. Our devotional reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verses 1 to 15. Our background scripture comes from Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 18, and verse 34. And then Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. Printed passage and our lesson text comes from Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. Our key verse uh, from that passage is verses 36 and 37, which read, Which now of these three thinketh thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said unto him, Go and do thou likewise. Our aims from the quarterly or number one, explore the concept of neighbor in the conversation between Jesus and the lawyer. Number two, value people as God does. And number three, Share love and mercy with those who are in need, even those who are different from you. The Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly lesson has three divisions after the introduction. The first is titled Insight Without Understanding. That's covered between Luke chapter 10, verses 25 and 28. The second is Hiding Behind the Law. That's covered between Luke chapter 10, verses 29 and 32. And the third is going beyond the law. It's covered between Luke chapter 10, verses 33 and 37. Uh, from the standard commentary, the lesson title is Love Your Neighbor. Love Your Neighbor. And additional aims are... Define neighbor as Jesus does and provide current examples. Number two, explain the importance of how Jesus shifts the focus from legalism to true obedience. And then number three, make a plan to proactively love a neighbor uh, he or she has historically preferred to avoid. Uh, standard commentary has three divisions as well. The first is questioning. That's verses 25 to 29. The second is storytelling, verses 30 to 37. And the third is directing, Luke chapter 10, verses 36 and 37. We have a good lesson today. And one uh, passage taken from a passage that many of us are very familiar with. But as I often tell my Sunday school class, um, I, I can hardly go through a passage, uh, that I'm very, that I think I'm very familiar with without learning something new. And, and I did, in fact, as I read through this passage, which is our lesson text today, um, going to give a, a little background. This, uh, this event or discussion, if you will, that Jesus has with, a an expert in the law, as we will read, um, was preceded by the return of 70 disciples that Jesus had sent out two by two to preach the gospel. And he sent them out in advance of his uh, actually visiting these places that he, they were sent. And they had come back and he gave them strict instructions, you know, as to what to take with them and what to do and, and so forth. And they came back rejoicing, uh, saying that even the demons were subject to them uh, in his name. Uh, and Jesus, uh, of course, celebrates with them, but tells them not to rejoice 
because the demons were subject to them, but because their names were written uh, in heaven by his father in heaven. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that obviously we're going to be discussing is uh, what we've come to know as the parable of the Good Samaritan. And as I was reading um, in the prior chapter, chapter 9, uh, I, I read between verses 51 and 56, and it, it just, it was really curious that Jesus would use a Samaritan as the hero in that parable, uh, certainly after this episode uh, in Samaria. And if, if you'll, uh, if, if you'll uh, <clears throat> indulge me, I would like to read that passage very quickly. It says, Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered into a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Um. And that's to say that, uh, you know, Jesus, of course, being God, uh, had a love for sinners and even those who despitefully used him, as we learned in the in last week's lesson. Uh, it was uh, counterintuitive, if you will. Uh, what Jesus did was contrary to human nature. You know, we are uh, taught. Uh, by one another, uh, to love others that love us, uh, to do good to those who do good to us. But Jesus' um, uh, love, which is the love of God, of course, was counterintuitive, that loved those who even hated us. And we know that we were all enemies of God before uh, he called us out of darkness into light. And the lesson today, uh, in summary, we're going to really try to... Um, we're going to try to accomplish the aims uh, of our lessons, uh, but we're going to learn what, uh, how we love God, uh, essentially. You know, we love God. Uh, our love for God, if you will, is demonstrated by our love for others, uh, even those, as I said, who we might have thought to be enemies or or, or indeed our enemies. And so um, we're going to just... Uh, give a little additional background, and then we're going to get into our lesson verse by verse after a short word of prayer. Uh, again, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, and uh, he is giving a series of parables. Uh, and we know what a parable is. A parable is uh, a story that uses common everyday uh, things that uh, to relay heavenly uh, truths, uh, and uh, we're going to be learning about how God intends for us, His children, to treat their neighbors. And 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 you might think that this is something new, some new revelation uh, that Jesus is sharing with His disciples of that day, and certainly with us. But uh, more, almost fifteen hundred years before. We see in our devotional reading from Leviticus chapter 19 that Jesus, I'm sorry, that, that God actually through Moses had declared how the Israelites were to treat their neighbors. In Leviticus chapter 19 and uh, chapter, uh, chapter 19, 18 rather, and verse 34. And I think the, a, the good reason for going back and reading what God said way back in Leviticus, almost 1,500 years before, is uh, some might argue that 
the Jews believed that their neighbors were only Israelites, uh, only people of of uh, of their kind, if you will, and of their faith. Uh, but we're going to see that God uh, had something else beyond that in mind. So verse 18 of Leviticus chapter 19 reads, You shall not take vengeance nor bear any judge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord because of his authority. I am the Lord, all caps, Jehovah, the self-existent one, you are to do this. Now, from that verse, you might think that the Jews thought, hey, their neighbors are Israelites. He says, of your people, right? But let's skip down to verse 34, where he says, the stranger who dwells among you shall be to you as one born among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you're, you were strangers in the land of Egypt. And again, he declares, I am the Lord, your God. I am Jehovah, the self-existing one. And because of my authority, I am commanding you to do this. And this is not a suggestion. It wasn't a suggestion in either one of those verses. It is a commandment. And of course, we are commanded to do the same as Christians. So let's just go before the throne. Father, we do thank and praise you for yet another opportunity to study your precious word. And Lord, we know that uh, this is a familiar passage, Lord. We have read it. Uh, we believe we've understood it. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to put it in practice, Lord, uh, each and every day, Lord. Uh, Lord, uh, help us to uh, to not be so concerned about who is our neighbor, Lord, but who we are a neighbor to, Lord. Help us to show your love, your compassion, Lord, even to those who um, who despitefully use us, Lord, who who murmur and talk against us, Lord, who may even hate us, Lord. Help us to show your love to them, Lord, the same compassion, Lord, that the hero of our lesson text shows to one uh, that society uh, said was his enemy. We pray this in the precious and most holy name of Jesus. Amen. All right, we're going to read our the passage uh, for the first division of the quarterly commentary. Again, that uh, first division is entitled Insight Without Understanding. And I'm going to read it from the King James Version. And it reads, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do and thou shalt live. So, first of all, backing up to 25, verse 25, the lawyer here is not a uh, <clears throat> uh, the typical trial lawyer that we might um, imagine or that uh, we're familiar with in our day, uh, but this was a expert in the law, in the Old Testament law and the traditions. <laughs> Uh, some of them may have been scribes as well, but I think there was, there were those who were experts in the law, uh, distinct from scribes, and so he was very familiar with uh, the letter of the law, and by his answer, he demonstrated that he realized that it was not just keeping the letter of the law by which he could gain eternal life. Uh, he said uh, exactly what uh, the Shema, uh, Deuteronomy 6, 5 says, and what Jesus says elsewhere in the Gospels, which is the great, when he was asked what the greatest commandment was in the law. He said the same thing, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second, he said, is like unto it, love thy neighbor as thyself. And of course, that comes from Leviticus chapter 19. And I would say both verses 
18 and 34 from Leviticus 19. So what does this mean now? I mean, is Jesus, Jesus, uh, well, let's go on. Let's go on to verse, uh, verse two. I'm sorry, verse 26. Uh, Jesus asked him, well, the lawyer is asking, uh, you know, what shall he do to to inherit eternal life or everlasting life? And then, of course, Jesus, excuse me, Jesus recognizing that he is an expert in the law, asked him, to, you know, didn't answer him uh, directly, but re answered him with a question. He wanted to know how he understood or interpreted the law, given his uh, understanding, again, of the letter of the law. And again, the lawyer uh, demonstrates insight into the fact that God did not intend for man to be saved uh, by uh, following do's and don'ts or keeping the letter of the law, but, but that uh, man should devote himself fully uh, to God, to love God. And of course, as, as we'll say a bit more of uh, in a minute, that love manifests itself in our love, in our care for, in our compassion for others. I mean, God does not need anything from us. You know, God said if he was hungry, he wouldn't ask us. The cattle on a thousand hills are his. You know, even when we we donate our money and some do that sacrificially, it is not to benefit God. It's to benefit others, okay, children of God, to advance his gospel. And those, of course, uh, who are in the unbelieving world, to, it's to advance his gospel and to do the work of, the, of, of, of God here on earth. Now, um, so then verse 27 says, uh, and he answered, this is after Jesus asked him, you know, he said unto him, what is written in the law? How readest thou? Or how do you understand this? Verse 27 says, and he answered, and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and a uh, heart, soul, strength, and mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. So again, he understands uh, what the law requires. And then verse 28, and this is the Lord speaking, and he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. Do this, and thou shalt live. Now, I should go back um, and uh, explain that the Shema, that what the Lord, I mean, what the lawyer recited there was something that the Jewish men recited every day. So it was very familiar to him. Uh, this was the greatest, or these, if you will, were the greatest commandments. And they can be reduced to just one, you know, and love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. Because if we love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we're going to do as God does, we're going to obey him. We're going to uh, keep his commandments. And, and of course, indeed, one of those is to love as he does, to love others as, uh, as he does, even those who are our enemies. So when Jesus says in verse 28, do this and you shall live, is he saying that if you keep the law perfectly, you will have eternal life? Yes. <laughs> However, since none of us can keep the law perfectly, we all have to seek divine mercy. Okay, none of us can keep the law perfectly. Therefore, we are sinners in need of a Savior, someone to uh, deliver us from the penalty, the power, and ultimately from the very presence of our sin. And we know when Jesus came and laid down his life for us, his righteousness was imputed to us and our sin debt was transferred to him. So if one could keep the law perfectly, yes, they would indeed inherit eternal life. But no one, no one can or has, can keep the law perfectly except the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why he was the perfect lamb without spot and who was the only one qualified to take our to take on our sin debt. So let's move on to the next 
division, which is entitled Hiding Behind the Law, chapter 10, verses 29 to 32, again from the King James Version. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from, Jer from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. Now, again, we are looking at the division entitled Hiding Behind the Law. And this begins the second division of the standard, which is entitled Storytelling, or this is the parable. So Jesus does not answer the lawyer. The lawyer is uh, answered the, he answered the question correctly, and rather than being satisfied with Jesus' commendation, he feels like he's got to justify himself or maybe try to show Jesus up or ask him a tougher question, if you will, and that is, who is my neighbor? And most likely, he had a presumption of who his neighbor was. His neighbors looked like him and act like him. They were uh, Pharisaic, or I don't know that this man was a Sadducee, but they were uh, they were those that he had some uh, likeness to, and certainly not sinners, certainly not harlots or publicans or Samaritans. Uh, they were certainly good people that he uh, felt that uh, he was only obligated to love. So he asked this question probably with that uh, presumption uh, and thinking that uh, he was asking Jesus a tougher question and justifying his uh, himself in the process, uh, making himself look uh, more astute or intelligent at the expense of Jesus. So Jesus doesn't answer him. He just starts telling a story, or he, he, he starts a parable here. And uh, he, he said, a certain man, he does not identify the man in verse 30, a certain man. So we don't know that the man was Jewish or Gentile, uh, or Jewish or Samaritan, but it was a certain man who was coming down from Jerusalem. Uh, and Jerusalem... Uh, is about 2,500 feet above sea level. Jericho is about 800 feet above sea level. So it is like a 1,700 foot drop over 17 miles. There were 17 miles along this road uh, between Jericho and Jerusalem or Jerusalem and Jericho. So the man was coming down... Um, Perhaps he, well, he had some business, uh, whether worship or some other business in Jerusalem, and perhaps he's coming home. And uh, verse uh, 31 says, and by chance there came down, I'm sorry, and, and verse 30 continues, it says, and fell among thieves which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Let me go back and read that verse again. And Jesus answered, answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, one of the, one of the things that made parables especially effective in communicating uh, spiritual truths was uh, if they were based on something really realistic, commonplace that people could really relate to. And everyone in this audience, uh, I'm sure, uh, recognized, and Jesus, this was a teaching environment. Everyone was seated. The lawyer stood up to speak. So this is a teaching environment. Uh, everyone in the audience was familiar with that stretch of road. And they knew there were caves there. They knew it was winding. They knew it was treacherous. They knew it was, uh, 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 there were several places where people could be ambushed along the way. 
which is probably why most people traveled in groups when they went back and forth. But this man, this brave soul is hiking it alone. So he is, uh, the thieves have no compassion on him. They, they, they not only rob him, strip him of his clothing, but they, they try to kill him. You know, they leave him for dead. He's half dead there. Verse 31, and by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other way. Now, priests, of course, uh, were God's uh, representatives to man and man's representative to God. They were the mediators between God and man, and certainly they should have displayed godly characters. They were, of course, of the Aaronic priesthood, or they were Levites, they were of the uh, the priestly tribe trained to serve uh, the people in spiritual matters. And uh, of course, um, uh, the priests, now, now some would argue, well, you know, the priest uh, may have thought he was dead and didn't want to uh, make himself ceremonial, un ceremonially, excuse me, ceremonially unclean by touching him, which he would have to do to see if he was dead. And so he, he just continued down. But uh, one of the commentators says, well, it's interesting, the priest was not going up to Jerusalem to serve, but he was coming down from Jerusalem, which uh, would indicate that he'd already served and he was perhaps going home. So the ceremonial uncleanness was not uh, an issue, most likely. Uh, he might have thought, hey, if I uh, go over there, maybe the same uh, thieves or whoever uh, <clears throat> uh, beat this guy up or lurking around and they'll do the same to me. It may have been just fear. Okay. But for whatever reason, uh, he was not compassionate enough to go to this man's aid. Uh, he passed rather, he passed by on the other side. And the thing is we could speculate all day about, uh, the motives of the priest, but we're not told that. And that's not the, the big issue here. Uh, verse 32 says, and likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. So the Levite might have gotten a little closer, uh, but still did not provide any aid, any assistance for this this guy who uh, apparently was in dire need, probably bleeding profusely uh, and dying. Uh, he passed by on the other side as well, maybe for the same reasons the priest did. Maybe he was fearful that the same ones that uh, jumped this man, the thieves that jumped this man, were lurking around to jump him. But again, we're not told about motives, but we know uh, we have various motives for not uh, being a neighbor and assisting those in need. And I'm, I'm talking about us now. We have uh, various reasons why we may drive by, see someone stranded on the road, uh, and not pull over and try to offer assistance. We might think uh, about uh, maybe them harming us or we might th not have time or whatever, but we uh, make excuses for doing that. And this lesson really is intended to remind us uh, that God intends for us to show compassion. We're going to talk about that word in just a minute, to show compassion, to love others as we love ourselves. If we were stranded on the road, certainly we would want someone to to assist us. Anyway, let's, we're going to go on. So let's move on to our our third division, which is entitled "Going Beyond the Law" and the quarterly and the uh, again. This continues the storytelling, which is part of the second division in the standard, and it reads. This is covered between verses 33 and 37. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, that's where the man, the wounded man was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow... When he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, 
take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of the, these three thinketh thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, he being the lawyer, he that showed mercy on him. Then Jesus, then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. Okay, let's back up to verse 33. Again, it reads, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came uh, where he was. We don't know whether he was going up to Jerusalem or down to Jericho, but he's passing by, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Now, first of all, what's the significance of identifying this man who is going to offer assistance, provide assistance to this wounded victim? Um, well, he identified the other three. He has not identified, while he has not identified the victim, it's probably fairly certain that he's a Jew. He's a Jewish. He's coming down from Jerusalem and he's a Jew. Perhaps the Samaritan is a a merchant who, <clears throat> despite the fact that the Jews despise the Samaritans, uh, is allowed to to travel back and forth in uh, in the the course of his commerce. Uh, now, uh, those of you who've spent any time in the Bible know about the Samaritans. Uh, they were <clears throat> a mixed breed, if you will, that resulted from um, the remnant of the Jewish citizens of the northern kingdom that were left in the land uh, after the Assyrian captivity in 722 B.C. Uh, and, of course, the Assyrians had a custom of bringing in other peoples, other cultures, and intermixing them with conquered people. And so over centuries, uh, the Jewish people intermarried with the uh, with the Gentiles that were brought in, and of course they were a mixed breed, and that is why the uh, those of Judea, uh, those uh, uh, the Jews that had been in captivity in Babylon, who uh, apparently kept their bloodlines distinct for the most part, despised the Samaritans because they, and they also, uh, the Samaritans only recognize the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, and they thought that uh, God was to be worshipped on Mount Garrison. We remember that from John chapter 4, verses 20, when Jesus uh, spoke to the woman at the well in Samaria. Uh, so they are, and, and, and of course, the intermarriage no doubt brought all kinds of other strange customs and strange beliefs so they didn't know what they believed as jesus said we know we the jews know what we believe you don't know what you believe so that was one of the reasons that those were the reasons uh, some of the reasons i should say that the, the jewish people despise the samaritans so and, and 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 so jesus is using the samaritan as the hero here okay the one that uh, the verse says, had compassion on him. And what, what, what does the word compassion mean? I mean, it, yeah, it can mean sympathy, uh, but not just sympathy. If you look at the, uh, the dictionary from the Webster, even, it says sympathetic consciousness of others' distress together with a desire to alleviate it. It is Sympathy and empathy as well to the point where it moves a person to do something about the situation. Uh, you know, you don't just say, oh, I'm, I'm sure the the priest and the Levite that passed by were sympathetic. They say, oh, poor guy, poor sucker or whatever, and they just passed by. But the Samaritan had sympathy to the point that it moved him to do something to alleviate the suffering uh, that this victim was 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 enduring. Okay, verse thirty four says, and he went to him and bound up his wounds, and poured in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. 
So the man, um, the the Samaritan now, uh, at he's probably had some of the same thoughts that the uh, the priest and the Levi did. Hey, the, the, the same the guys that did this to him may be lurking around. They may do it to me, but he took the risk in spite of that. Uh, he bound up his wounds. The man was wounded, perhaps mortally, if uh, the Samaritan hadn't come and rendered this uh, this assistance, you know. And he poured in uh, oil and wine. Oil, of course, uh, was in, intended to kind of uh, be a an aid for the pain or to relieve some of the pain. And the wine was uh, a disinfectant of sort that, that was typically used to clean the wounds. Uh, both, the, both the Greeks and the, uh, the Romans, rather, and the Jews used the same uh, remedies, if you will. Uh, of course, oil, uh, wine has alcohol, which is a disinfectant. So it was used to clean the wounds, and he used oil. And then he put the man on his own beast, most likely a donkey, and took him to the inn. We don't know how far that was, but that meant what? The Samaritan had to walk. The Samaritan walked and took the man to an inn. And not only that, he cared for him overnight. I mean, we don't, you know, the man was probably in really bad, uh, uh, bad situation. He probably changed bandages. He probably comforted him to the extent he could, but he cared for the man overnight. And then, um, and, and, and in doing so, showed great compassion. And, and the Lord Jesus intended for uh, this to demonstrate, I believe, the kind of sacrificial um, care and service we are to provide even strangers. Um, you know, it, it's easy to give someone a few dollars. You know, you see someone that's in need and to give them a few dollars and then just, just go on about your business. But how do you handle someone that that real that has some needs that that, that are going to cost you some 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 sacrifice i mean maybe some real money or some real time or some work or some effort you know the lord is is showing us the kind of compassion we are to have even on strangers we go back to leviticus chapter 30 chapter sorry 19 verse 34 and he said the stranger you are to treat as yourself as one born among you in other words, so, uh, and, and what is he doing? He's showing us how God loves even the, uh, 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 I mean, those who hate, hated him, uh, sinners, of course, uh, those who have disregarded him, uh, God loves us. Uh, there was another verse in our, uh, another passage in our devotion that spoke of God uh, making the, um, uh, the sun to shine uh, on the just and the unjust and the rain to fall on the the good and the evil, and, and I, I use that verse a lot uh, when I'm talking to unbelievers and talking about uh, the common grace that God uh, uh, bestows on even the sinners of this world that they're only going to enjoy in this life because if they leave this life not of accepting, not have, having it accepted the Lord Jesus as their Savior and His uh, and not accepting the payment that he made for their sins, then they're going to bear the penalty of their own sins and be beyond the common grace that God even extends to sinners in this life. And, and when I say sinners, I mean those who are perpetually and habitually in unrepentant sinners. We are all sinners, of course. So let's go on. So he uh, cares for the man overnight. He's a businessman. I mean, he's got to uh, he's got to move on. There's a question here from one of the commentaries. I thought I would I thought I would ask, and and it's you know it's a simple question <laughs> we could probably ask ourselves any day. It says if you saw a car broken down broken down on the side of the road, uh, would using a cell phone to call for assistance be the same as stopping to offer help personally? Why or why not? You know. Uh, and the, the digging deeper uh, response is if stopping to help personally meant risking your own safety in the proce process, would you do it? Okay, um, we need to ask ourselves that. You know, uh, we, we, we trust God. Uh, we should be trusting God every day. And I'm not suggesting that we take unnecessary risk. Uh, but God wants to be 
compassionate, wants us to love others as he loves. I mean, he is the paragon. He is the model. Lord Jesus is the model for the kind of love that we are to uh, to have for others. Verse 35. And on the morrow or the next day, when he departed, he took two pence or, den- or I think denarii um, and gave them to the host and said unto him, take care of him and whatsoever thou spendest more when I come again, I will repay thee. Now, um, this man is really going well beyond what uh, would be expected, perhaps even of a Jew uh, towards a fellow Jew. You know, and then, of course, the Lord is purposely uh, uh, sh- uh, describing the effort uh, and the care that this man has taken to as an example for us, you know, now, um, uh, a denarii or pence, uh, was a day, uh, typically a day's wage. So he gives the, the innkeeper, uh, two days wages for this man's care and basically gives him carte blanche says whatever else he needs, you know, you provide that for me and I will reimburse you when I come back this way. All right. And, uh, and the man probably was a regular a visitor to that inn and had uh, a good reputation and, and credit uh, with the innkeeper. Now, um, one of the commentators suggests that that was enough for about a two month stay. That, that's kind of hard for me to believe, <laughs> but uh, he says that uh, some scholars estimate that the two pence would have been sufficient for two months of room and board in the end. But even if it was just two weeks or a month, uh, that was a lot. I mean, that's that's a lot of money uh, for him to give uh, for the care of a perfect stranger. I mean, let's think about that. Would you be willing to do that? Um, you know, two days, even two days wages uh, today. We know that won't buy a month of uh, or two months of hotel stay today, but would you be willing to give that to someone in need, and not not someone, um, a friend or family member? Certainly, you would do that for them, but a stranger in need. Verse thirty six. Now we're in the final division here, um, from the from both the quarterly and the standard going beyond the law and uh, from the standard it's directing verse 36 says which now of these three thinketh thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves so again Jesus did not answer the lawyer's question uh, directly he answered the lawyer's question with a question okay he did not give him a definitive answer, he answered the lawyer's question with a question. Now, the the lawyer asks, who is my neighbor? Now, now let, let's pay attention to this now. The lawyer asks, who and who is my neighbor? You know, probably with a quirk on, on his face. But Jesus turns the question, question around and said, he says, which of the three do you think was neighbor to the one who fell among the thieves. I mean, do, do you get you get what Jesus is doing here? Rather than what Jesus is suggesting is rather than us thinking about who our neighbor is and trying to find some loophole in the law that excludes us from caring for anyone and everyone in need that comes across our path that God that God has given us means to assist. Okay, He's saying. Who are you a neighbor to? And that's the way we should think. Who can I be a neighbor to? Uh, instead of who is my neighbor? And of course, uh, the that's a rhetorical question. You know, everybody, okay, uh, th- that I'm asking is a rhetorical question. But Jesus is asking the lawyer specifically. And verse 37a says, and he said, he that showed mercy on him. Now, one of the commentators makes a, 
a point of the fact that the lawyer did not mention this, the the uh, Samaritan. He just could, he couldn't get that out. You know, he, he just couldn't hear himself allow that to come out of his mouth that a Samaritan was the good neighbor, okay, was the neighbor to the one who had fallen among the thieves or to the victim here. Uh, but I don't know that uh, that that was <laughs> that was the case. It may have been. He may have been so steeped in his prejudice that he couldn't get that out. But he rightly answered the question: the one who showed mercy. And this word mercy can be translated. The word translated mercy can also be translated compassion. Can also be translated love. Okay, love your neighbor as yourself. And then finally, seven. 37b says, then Jesus, um, then said Jesus rather unto him, go and do thou likewise. Now, it's one thing to be an expert in the law as the Old Testament and the traditions. Uh, it is something else uh, to do the law. And that's why James tells us to be doers of the law not here is only deceiving ourselves. You know, the, and I, I say this often to my Sunday school class and wherever I have a teaching opportunity, the point of understanding God's word is first to know him better. We get, we get, we, we get to know God. We get to know the Lord Jesus through his word and obviously the witness of the Holy Spirit but also we get to know his will. We learn his will for our lives, his, his commands for us, okay? But w so what's the point of learning them? Just to, uh, to have some, uh, some intellectual, um, to go through some intellectual exercise, uh, or to, 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 to go through some memory exercise perhaps? No, it is to do it. To, to, to learn it is to do it. Mechanics don't take... Years and years, uh, 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 have years and years of training uh, just to sit back and, and do nothing with it. They, they work on cars. They repair cars. Uh, it is we learn God's word so we can be doers of his word, faithful doers of his word. And, of course, uh, the more we know about God, the more intimate our relationship with God can be when we know his will. And certainly we can imitate him more and more insofar as uh, we can uh, uh, display the communicable attributes of God, love, mercy, grace, uh, not, the in, not the uncommunicable ones, but certainly the communicable attributes of God. And so with that, I think this was a great lesson. And God, uh, the Lord Jesus uh, provided uh, a parable in response to the lawyer uh, trying to be cute, trying to justify himself uh, and asking something that perhaps would give him a, uh, the answer, which would give him a loophole and lessen uh, the requirement for him to, uh, to love anyone other than he's already loving. And that are those like him, probably uh, uh, in the same financial, socioeconomic uh, 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 strata, if you will, uh, uh, same uh, race, uh, same culture, uh, and of course we have those partitions now in our throughout our society. All this foolishness that has been going on uh, this summer uh, in the streets have been because of racial tensions uh, built up over years uh, that do, certainly don't belong in the church. You know, they certainly don't belong in the church. But unfortunately, we even see some of these in the church. So. Uh, we pray that uh, you have understood uh, a little more about this passage uh, than uh, you did before. And we pray that God will continue to bless you until such time as we, we meet again. Amen.